At the new Plainfield Bacchus Emergency Care Center, we're opening new doors to better health. More than just a 24-7 emergency room, the new center provides services you and your family need to get better, stay healthy, and be well. Choose wisely. Choose Bacchus. Good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Chernier <clears throat> with the Day Newspaper, and I uh, welcome you to tonight's Candidates Forum. Uh, glad to see such a good turnout. Uh, before I get started, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the publisher of the day, Gary Ferrugia, who's going to have a few words. Thank you, Paul. Um, this is a, a new um, experiment for us. Uh, we have historically um, interviewed each individual candidate um, uh, with the editorial board. Um, and then um, over the course of the campaign, we would make um, our, our political endorsements at the end of the campaign season. Um, last cycle, two years ago, we um, brought the candidates in, although we brought them in by political party. So we had the Democrats in one night and then the Republicans in the second night and had more of a, an informal forum where there was give and take, people talking, um, we, we cover a number of issues, and that worked extremely well. So this time around, we thought we would um, push this out even a little more and involve public forums. And we're going to be doing uh, a number of these all around the region between now and Election Day, uh, bringing in um, the Senate candidates and the State House candidates. Um, this is a two-hour uh, forum. The first hour will be for the House candidates, and then um, at 8 o'clock we'll switch out and the Senate candidates uh, will sit in and we'll have a, um, a forum about that. Paul will be uh, doing the questions. Um, during the course of uh, this, uh, the gentleman over here in the tie, Tim Cotter, our managing editor, um, he's been handing out index cards. If any of you have questions that you would like to direct to the candidates, uh, get an index card from Tim, and um, he will uh, be editing these through it. Paul will be asking some initial questions, and then we'll be able to take some questions from the audience. I really appreciate uh, all of you turning out tonight. This is a terrific uh, turnout, especially so early in the season, and I want to thank the candidates also for agreeing to participate. So we all have a front row seat here to see democracy in action, and I want to thank you again for coming. I'll turn it over to Paul. Okay, before we, uh, before we get started, just wanted to uh, <clears throat> thank a couple of people. Um, the uh, Guam Public Library did a great job setting up for tonight's uh, debate. Uh, and uh, thanks to uh, Betty Ann Ryder, the director. Uh, also, I'd like to point out, you see some cameras uh, set up here. And uh, tonight's forum will be uh, later available on uh, GMTV Channel 2 on both Comcast and Thames Valley. Uh, and it will be available on the website for the Groton Public uh, Library, uh, grotonpl.org, and on theday.com. So uh, you get to see it live tonight, but uh, uh, as a service uh, uh, to the public, it will be also available out there for other people to view. Uh, at their convenience. Um, introducing uh, tonight's uh, candidates from uh, your left, uh, we have from the uh, 40th Assembly District, which uh, consists of the third uh, portion of Groton, the northern portion of Groton, and uh, the, roughly the Gales Ferry section. Uh, we have uh, the incumbent uh, Democrat, Representative Ted McCausha. And we have his Republican challenger, Andrew Lavery. And in the, from the 41st district, uh, which is roughly the two thirds of the southern part of Groton and uh, uh, some of the southern neighborhoods over in New London on the other side of the river, uh, we have the uh, incumbent, Representative Alyssa Wright, the Democrat, and Republican Harry Watson. And we're going to be, be, uh, begin with. Um, uh, a brief opportunity for uh, all the uh, uh, candidates to introduce themselves to you and say a few words, and we'll we'll start with uh, uh, Representative McCarsha, and we'll work this way. So, Representative McCarsha. 
Thanks, Paul. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank the day for this forum. Uh, this is uh, a unique opportunity for us. Um, I'm Edward McCausher. A lot of people know me as Ted. I'm the uh, 40th district uh, representative. I've been the uh, state representative now for just about 10 years, since 2003. I formerly served on the uh, Groton Town Council for two terms, the Groton Board of Education for two terms. And uh, as I said, I've been in the House since 2003. And one thing I've found that the nature of the job is really kind of has dual responsibilities. I mean, it, it has to do with serving your district, but it also, uh, you're also uh, representing the entire state and making policy and laws for the entire state. And, uh, you know, in my capacity as a, a local representative, I've fought for uh, uh, interests that we have. One of them was a sub base, if you recall. We had a, the BRAC process several years ago, and in response to that, we formed a coalition. Uh, we stopped the BRAC process, and since then we formed an Office of Military Affairs. Uh, we've also invested in the in the base. That was a consideration, the BRAC process, how involved are people in that. Sub-base is very important to us. Uh, just a few things. I mean, when Groton needed money, we needed $2 million to uh, 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 com complete renovations to our wastewater treatment plant. I was able to secure that. When New London needed new schools but couldn't afford them, uh, myself and many others, including Andrea Stillman, who's here tonight, came up with a plan for a magnet district, and New London was able to build three new schools for only $3 million as a result, and created magnet schools. In Groton, when the state withheld funds for both the Kolnaski School and Fitch High School, I was able to recover the funds, uh, almost $3 million, that the state withheld. Um, in addition, uh, and myself and other, well, 90 seconds isn't very long. <laughs> Let me just say as far as this, you know, the uh, state responsibilities, my big emphasis has been on tax fairness and, uh, and try to eliminate tax breaks, lower tax rates, do something. I think the property tax is our biggest problem. I think it's important for not only residents but also businesses. And uh, maybe I can expand on that a little later, but 90 seconds goes by fast. Thank you. And Mr. Lavery? Lavery? Excuse me, Lavery. <laughs> Common mis mispronunciation. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Lavery. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I'm a Navy veteran. I was in the Navy for nearly 11 years. Served uh, one, uh, one year in Afghanistan in 2009. I'm a small business owner, member of the Groton City Charter Revision Commission. I uh, do community volunteer work. I work for the U.S. Department of Commerce for a little while up in the Middletown office. And it's my first time running for any elected office. Um, I want to be your state representative because with a state unemployment rate at 8.5%, state debt over $20 billion and increasing every year, our state budget increasing by about a billion dollars annually, and just life becoming harder and harder for everyone in Connecticut, I just, I just can't sit by idly anymore and watch our state continue on a path to ruin. Now, from now until Election Day, I'm going to be telling everyone in Groton and Ledyard why they should vote for me. I'm going to tell them my ideas and how I plan to implement them. But there's two things I want to stress to everyone. One is that no matter what, I will always tell you the truth. I'll do so because it's the right thing to do, and you deserve nothing less. The second thing is, if you elect me and send me to Hartford, I promise I'll be a leader. A leader who will lead from the front, not from the back. A leader who will make the tough decisions, and a leader you can count on. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> next up, uh, Representative Wright. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's an honor to represent the 41st District in the General Assembly, and I'm, I'm very proud of my track record as an effective legislator and of the historic progress that we have made on so many key issues through the unprecedented challenges of the global economic downturn that began four years ago when the bottom fell out of financial markets, the global economy collapsed, and state revenues went into absolute freefall. In just this past term alone, we closed a $3.6 billion budget gap while also passing major legislation that will help grow the economy and create jobs, reform and strengthen education, including our state technical high schools, expand healthcare access, improve storm response, and protect the environment. 
I am particularly proud of my accomplishments that are of specific benefit to our area in restoring $1.6 million in municipal revenue sharing money for Groton per year, in securing more than $6 million for Grasso Technical High School upgrades, in our state's demonstrated commitment to preserve the Naval Submarine Base and the important role that it plays in our region's economy through investments to enhance its military value in restoring $27 million in the state's tourism marketing account, which had been reduced to $1 in the previous administration. And most importantly, in protecting municipal aid and education aid throughout the economic downturn in order to relieve upward pressure on property taxes. Make no mistake, nurturing our economic recovery and establishing the foundation for long-term economic growth is a long-term effort. And as we emerge from the deepest recession in 80 years, I will continue to advocate for strategic investments to stimulate economic growth, improve our schools, reform the property tax, ensure prudent management of taxpayer resources at both the state and local levels, and to make sure that our tax policy, economic policy, and fiscal policy all work together so that ultimately we will grow our way back to economic health and restore stability to our system of public finance. <laughs> and our last introduction from Harry Watson. Um, thank you, thank you for the day, for putting this on uh, today. I can't uh, pass up this opportunity. My mom's here. Hi, mom. Um, <laughs> I'm Harry Watson, I'm a 20-year town councilor uh, and former three-term mayor, I'm married, have four children. I'm retired from Pfizer, I retired in 2003 uh, to become a home dad. Uh, I have three children home, at, at, had three children home who are now in college. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree that I received five years ago from Eastern, and now I teach as a substitute in the Groton school system. It's a good time for me. Uh, the nest just emptied. Uh, I have the time to go to Hartford. And I'm going to read something. Uh, a key deciding point for me um, this year was uh, actually poolside. Uh, my youngest son swam for Fitch High School, and another student whose dad was uh, a, a local business owner, small business owner, uh, encouraged me to run for the seat. Um, he explained how frustrated small businesses are in southeastern Connecticut. Important issues, state unfunded mandates, uh, taxes in Connecticut are out of control, government's too big, unemployment has just again risen. I just read July, the figures are up. Uh, and we're not business friendly. Uh, Pfizer is seriously downsizing. If elected, um, I would make every effort to meet with the public, local officials, constituents, businesses, uh, to find out what's on their minds. Um, I like to solicit input before going to Hartford. I believe Americans in general are tired of partisan politics. Uh, it's time for folks in Hartford to work together uh, for the best of the public. I like to go to Hartford to represent Groton and New London. And thank you. All right, let's get to some questions. Um, we're not, we, we don't have the candidates on a clock, but I, urge them to try to be uh, uh, brief as they can, get right to the point so we can get as many questions as possible. If someone is uh, dominating the time, I will kind of jump in and move it along, but hopefully that won't be necessary. Uh, the first questions are going to go to our challenges because they, after all, are asking you to, to make a change. So uh, this first question um, uh, goes to uh, Andrew Lavery. Yes, you're good. Andrew Lavery, and it's, uh, we've, we've gotten several questions concerning a real worry uh, about the future of Pfizer. And you can answer these questions from your seat now after the introduction, so your microphones are live. Um, so the question uh, is, what would you do as a state <coughs> legislator to try to increase the chances that Pfizer will remain part of our community and, and hopefully grow? Well, what I would do, one of the reasons why Pfizer is leaving is because the tax rate in Connecticut is not favorable to businesses, plain and simple. We went through the largest tax increase in state history, and I can tell you that as a business owner myself, there is nothing that slams the door in the face of business owners 
harder and faster than that tax increase. What I would do is to repeal the um, 77 tax and fee hikes imposed by the Malloy administration in 2011. That's a great place to start, and that's where, one place where I want to go. Um, another thing I would do is to create, or not create, excuse me, uh, pass a right to work law in this state. Right to work laws um, from 2000 to 2010, states with right to work laws saw a job increase of 10.3%. States without right to work laws saw a job increases of 1.9%. States with right to work laws simply weather economic depressions better and they perform better. <coughs> Thank you. And uh, Representative Makasha, uh, you know, what, what have you done to try to uh, uh, keep Pfizer here and growing as an employer, and, and what do you plan to do? Well, I think, you know, Pfizer is kind of a good case for uh, a state having done just about everything it could in terms of tax breaks. When, you know, someone says that they're leaving because of the tax environment, that's just not accurate when it comes to Pfizer. They, their buildings are in an enterprise zone. They've enjoyed tax breaks on their buildings for years. Uh, they also enjoy manufacturing new machinery and manufacturing exemption, which exempts all their lab equipment. They buy millions of dollars of uh, equipment a year. They don't pay, they have to pay taxes on it. <coughs> They've had every tax break you can imagine. So it's not a matter of tax policy that they're leaving. Now, the one thing we have tried to do, and, and we've done that, this with Jackson Labs, we've recognized that we need to build uh, you know, a, a framework and an infrastructure of uh, technology and bio, bioscience, and we uh, uh, created a, a new facility with uh, the uh, hospital uh, in, in Hartford for uh, Jackson Labs to come here, and, and we've invested $895 million in it. And the reason is we're trying to build a critical mass, is what we call it, for having that kind of, they're a world-class organization. Uh, Pfizer, one of the reasons they said they're leaving is because they want to partner with uh, research people in, in Cambridge. We haven't had that kind of uh, environment and so we're trying to create that in in Hartford <clears throat> but in terms of uh, tax policies Pfizer has gotten every imaginable uh, tax break our, our uh, Office of Economic Development has been in deep talks with them to try to keep them here and I think basically they're doing whatever they want their buildings in London when their tax exemption ran out that's when they decided to leave so I think we've done everything we could to keep them in in the future I think if we build the infrastructure for bioscience will attract new companies like Pfizer and hopefully, uh, you know, in the future will even exceed their capacity for science. And uh, Mr. Lavery, briefly, because I think uh, uh, Representative Makash went a bit longer than you, mm -hmm. if you could just kind of quickly respond you know, to one, his contention that it's not the taxes and, and, this, and this idea of the state being sort of in a partner and investor in attracting uh, and helping build uh, uh, bioscience. Well, you sort of Representative McCausch say that you know, they, they've had all these tax breaks, tax exemptions, everything imaginable. They've, the states work with them, and so they're not leaving because of the taxes in the state. Well, he just said shortly after that, that when the tax exemptions were up, they started packing out. So that, that's my point right there. The tax exemptions were up. <coughs> they left more money in their pocket when they gave them those tax exemptions, which is essentially, you know, giving them a tax break and essentially reducing their tax rate. You're just not reducing tax rates, nation, you know, not, excuse me, not nationwide, excuse me, statewide. So that's exactly what I want to do. I told you, as a small business owner, I'm telling you, tax increases affect businesses, especially small businesses, which creates about 70% of the jobs in this country. So, Okay, and uh, so let's uh, uh, move on to the, uh, the 41st District. And uh, uh, you know, Mr. Watson, if you could address the same question, uh, uh, what could you do as a, 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 a legislator? And you know, someone's pointed out you've been uh, a town official for a long time in Groton. Uh, while uh, through the good times and bad. So if you kind of address this issue of Pfizer and what might be done to keep it here and encourage it to start growing again. Okay, first you need to go back. When I, I worked at Pfizer for 36 years, uh, I saw Pfizer grow to what it is today. It's not the same company that I worked for in 1967 when I started there. Um, a little over 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, Pfizer became a global company. They used to be a small pharmaceutical company. And because of that, they've acquired a couple of really, they're the biggest pharmaceutical company in the world. Um, so when they acquire these other companies, they have all these other facilities to do business. And, and they have decided to, to unload some of these. Um, Ann Arbor, Michigan um, was 
was unloaded. They, 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 they closed that. Um, the unfortunate part of all of that is um, we're going to lose, if they close 118 and all the, all the buildings attached to it, we're going to lose 2 to $3 million a year in local taxes. Uh, we've already lost a huge amount of money with Seg 80 closing and them closing production across the street. Employees have gone from 5,000 down to 3,200. They say they're going to be up to 3,600 by the end of the year. I think what needs to happen is um, we need to think of somebody else moving into that place. Um, there's a glut of labs in the world. Um, the buildings that are going to be vacated are, um, are suitable for laboratory space. There has not been a study done on what those buildings could be used for. Uh, we need to think as a state and try to help Pfizer to try to remarket and do something else there and not lose all this tax money that we're going to be losing. So I'll leave it at that. And uh, the same question to uh, the incumbent, Representative Wright. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, I sometimes wonder what uh, Pfizer's decision might have been if um, the Jackson Labs um, genomic medicine project had been in place before Pfizer made its decision to relocate its research and development um, programs elsewhere. Uh, Connecticut has had and continues to have one of the richest research and development tax credit programs in the country. Um, Pfizer, as Representative McCausher mentioned, Pfizer received millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars in state and local assistance for um, the construction of, of, the, of its fac facility in, in, in New London. Um, those tax credits are detailed in uh, a report of the Office of uh, um, uh, Legislative Research um, uh, called State Assistance for Pfizer and Jackson Labs. Um, what I do know is that um, the Commissioner of the Department of Eco uh, Economic and Community Development, Catherine Smith, is actively engaged in discussions with Pfizer. Um, and partnering uh, with Pfizer um, proactively and aggressively as they seek an occupant or a purchaser of Building, building 118. And I have been in communication with her um, on several occasions. I do question what has the town of Groton done itself through its economic development uh, department and personnel to uh, address the situation, which um, it's not really a surprise. Um, there have been indications that something like this might happen. Um, Pfizer might, decision, might make a decision to downsize some of its operations. So I wonder what the town itself has done over the past several years to engage Pfizer itself and encourage uh, Pfizer's continued presence in Groton. After all, Groton is where Pfizer grew up into the global giant that it is. We, you know, we were the nursery for Pfizer when it moved here in the 1940s from Brooklyn, and it was a very small, um, a, a, a pharmaceutical startup. So, um, I'd like, can I, at this point, I'd like to give uh, uh, Mr. Watson a chance to respond. Uh, Representative Wright has, you know, pointed out what is what has Groton done. You've been uh, uh, on the council, of former man Groton. If you could uh, could address what you know, what has Groton done to try to uh, help the situation? Well, I figured that question was pointed at me. So, <laughs> um, what has Pfizer done? I know that there have been a lot of meetings. I have not gone. I've asked to go just recently uh, with our mayor, town manager, our economic uh, development specialist, uh, the mayor of the city, um, to talk with Pfizer. I think there's a little reluctance on Pfizer's side to talk back and give us a lot of information. Uh, I'm not sure how to bridge that gap. Um, that's why I asked last week if I could come along to some of, some of the next tours or whatever they have there. Um, I mean, it is what it is, and uh, 
Uh, I know the state has given them all, and you know, the two, the three million dollars that I'm talking about losing in taxes, it's not just 118, it's 286, it's a lot of buildings. It doesn't include the, the, the taxes on the equipment too, which is a huge number. Um, so, uh, I think the reluctance on Pfizer, Pfizer's part is a, a little bit of a problem to look at what else we could market these, uh, these buildings for. All right. Uh, so we're going to move on now to uh, another question, and uh, this will be to, uh, to Mr. Watson. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, um, well, the, uh, the, the question I was asking, uh, would you take a pledge uh, uh, to oppose any tax crease in the next uh, legislative session? Why or why not? It's a yes or no question? Well, you can I think the taxes have gone up too much. I've looked at my own personal income tax for Connecticut. Uh, it has gone up. Uh, and our sales tax going up. I mean, it was part of this three-point um, sacrifice that the governor put before us here when he got elected about yeah. union concessions, state stopped spending so much, and increase in taxes. And it's all um, taking the brunt. And But no. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, Representative Ray? Uh, no, I assume that's the Grover Norquist type of tax pledge. And my answer is no. I think um, uh, politicians who have taken the pledge and been elected to Congress um, have caused a, a tremendous gridlock in Washington. And I think the pledge is part of that reason. Um, as far as taxes go, I think uh, for many individuals and homeowners, the property tax is the largest tax that they pay. It's very regressive, um, and um, it contributes to the high cost of living and doing business in Connecticut, and is a, is a factor, I think, in the decision of retirees and others to relocate to lower property tax states. So um, I'm proud. I have been working uh, diligently in the legislature to try uh, to reform the property tax. We have made uh, um, progress in, in um, providing property tax relief to towns and cities in the form of, um, of, of increased uh, state aid through uh, the new municipal revenue sharing accounts, which pass through a portion of the conve state conveyance and sales tax to towns and cities in an effort to relieve uh, upward pressure on property taxes. We have maintained uh, municipal aid and education aid at stable levels and even increased aid in the case of Groton um, over the past two years, somewhat. Um, we have created uh, opportunities for intermunicipal uh, cooperation uh, to perform services jointly at uh, lowering costs for uh, local taxpayers and uh, costs overall. We have <coughs> funded a regional performance incentive grant programs to encourage um, intermunicipal collaborations. If you uh, could uh, sum up, Representative Wright. Thank you. If, and again, I appreciate the candidates, and I know these uh, issues be complex, but you know, if we could uh, we could be succinct, that'd be appreciated. And um, uh, Representative McCausch, I think uh, again, the question is, uh, you know, you, do you think it's a good idea? Are you ready to take a, a pledge of, of, of voting for no tax increases in the coming legislative session? Well, I've always had a problem with pledges because they, you know, they just, you know, they tend to just box you in. And I mean, I think George Bush found that out. But uh, I don't intend to, to uh, increase taxes. And I, but you can also interpret things that I'd like to do as an increase in taxes. For instance, um, there are a lot of tax expenditures, tax breaks that, you know, businesses receive, that properties receive, that nonprofits receive. I'd like those to be looked at. And if we eliminated um, some of these, I'm sure somebody would say that's a tax increase. Uh, it's similar to when, if we let the Bush uh, tax cuts expire, they had a time limit. Um, the argument is, well, you're, you're increasing taxes when you're just simply, so there's a lot of pitfalls to taking a pledge, and, uh, but I don't intend to increase. I think we, 
bit the bullet, you know, in the last session and in increase uh, income taxes. We've increased sales taxes. I think we should be able to live within that. I think, uh, frankly, uh, we need to find a way to have a sustainable budget without tax increases. So uh, maybe that's as close to a pledge as I get, but I don't intend to do it. And Ms. Henry. I will not vote for any tax increases, starters. Two, I will be more than willing to take a pledge to not increase any taxes in this state. We just went through the largest tax increase in state history and a retroactive tax hike. The state still spent too much money. Our last state budget was $37.6 billion. Just to keep pace with inflation, we would need a current budget of $39.4 billion. But yet the state passed a budget of 40.5, so we're outpacing the rate of inflation. We have the second highest gas tax in the United States, the first highest in the continental United States. We're the fifth highest when it comes to the cost of doing business in this country. We do not need to increase taxes any more than what they are right now and make it more expensive for people to live here and for businesses to do business here. And uh, our next uh, question goes to uh, Rep uh, Representative McCausher. And, it, and the, the question is, uh, um, what have you done uh, and, and what could you do to ease the burden of the special education costs on, uh, on school systems? Uh, you know, the, the concern being that uh, uh, the, the state does not fully reimburse for these costs and they can really uh, be a, a budget buster for, uh, uh, for the school system. Uh, uh, any efforts you've made or any, any ideas you have in well, that regard? I, I had a fairly comprehensive idea, which, and I think is, you know, required by our Constitution, the state is responsible for providing everyone an adequate uh, and equal education. It's a state responsibility. Uh, the, the state has passed that on to towns, although the state will, you know, still take control of it. I, I submitted legislation more than once for the state to take over all costs of education, which would include special education. I think that uh, local property taxes should go to local issues, but it's a state responsibility. I know that would be a uh, seismic shift in the way we finance things, but you know we're in this constant uh, dichotomy where <clears throat> the biggest budget item for towns, whether it's 60 or 70 percent of their budget, is education, uh, and and it's the state that mandates many of the things that the towns have to do. The state, uh, you know. We just passed an education reform bill. A lot of it had to do with, you know, a lot of it that eventually didn't pass, but it's, there's still elements of it, allow the state to take over school systems. So it's, it's really a, a, it's not a very effective way to, to administer education. So I think, you know, uh, the state should be paying for all costs of education, including special education. And towns should pay for their local costs. This is a state obligation. So I, you know, I, I think that's, ultimately the, the resolution of it. Uh, Mr. Lavery, on the issue of uh, special education, uh, how do we pay for it and maybe ease the burden on, uh, on the school systems who uh, bear the brunt of it? Well, what I would do is anywhere the state can help out, I want to see the state help out. If it's a matter of just, even if it's $100,000 towards the school system, towards the special education, that's great. If it's 200000 it's 300000 anything you can get to help the local level here on the school systems, what I do not agree with is having the state fund all local education. For starters, it takes away the control out of you. When someone else controls the purse strings, they have all the control. So local control must remain right here in Groton when it comes to educating your children because you know how to educate your children better than someone up in Hartford does. I also sit down with the uh, school superintendent and the special education teachers to find out the best way possible. I'm not an expert and I don't claim to be an expert in anything, but they're the experts. And I would definitely con uh, consult with them and find out what their ideas are and take those ideas up to Hartford. And uh, uh, Representative Wright? Um, I think that the state should assume more of the cost of education um, and, and including special education. And um, if, it, if the state did that, I also think that um, it should be made portable. So um, th th there wouldn't be the, um, the discrepancies in the special education um, benefits among towns. So that it would be more equal across towns. 
Hey, Mr. Watson. Yeah, this isn't as hard as I thought it was going to be tonight, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, Representative Wright uh, mentioned uh, local property taxes being the biggest taxes that we pay, and, and certainly what affects that is the mandates that the state of Connecticut passes on to local municipalities, one of them being um, uh, special education. Now, having said that, um, I am a part-time educator. Uh, and I see what goes on in the school system, uh, and I am a firm believer, my wife's on the Board of Education, so I, I'm, I don't have to say this, but uh, uh, she is. Um, all children in our state deserve an education. It doesn't, doesn't matter what their disability is, uh, they all deserve an education. Now, should it come on the backs of, uh, of the local taxpayers? Uh, it does. I think if the state is going to pass on mandates for special education, I think they need to help us with that. Um, they've been somewhat flat, I think, over the years. Um, and here again, communication is a key. If I get elected to Hartford, I intend to have office hours with our local board of education, town elected people, and the local community to find out what's going on so when I go up to Hartford, I know what their concerns are. All right, thank you. And, uh, uh Apologies to some of the audience of not asking your question exactly as written is because I'm getting three and four related questions on the same topic, so I'm trying to put them together so everyone gets at least some comment on the issue that concerns them. Uh, the next question goes to, begins with uh, Representative Wright, and uh, it's, uh, the question is, uh, should Connecticut maintain its prevailing wage law uh, which assures contractors on state municipal uh, construction projects are paid basically a union uh, uh, level wage. So should, they, should the state continue uh, with prevailing wage or should it be repealed or modified in some fashion? And that's to Representative Wright. Yes, I, I've supported the prevailing wage law and I believe it should be continued. I also supported it when the subject came up um, uh, when, when I was on the town council. So my answer is yes. I do support the prevailing wage law, and and and, and uh, as as it currently um, exists. And uh, Mr. Watson, it's very short. I think that it's something that should be looked at. Um, I can say that uh, we just had a baseball field built in our town, and and the cost went over, and part of that was due because of prevailing wage. Uh, We've taken a lot of heat here at the local level because of that. I don't know a real lot about it, but I certainly think it's something that should be looked at if I get up to Hartford. Thank you. And uh, uh, Mr. Lavery. The prevailing wage mandate I would definitely eliminate. Uh, for those who don't know what the prevailing wage law is, when the, it requires all states, excuse me, all towns, cities, and the state to pay inflated wages on construction projects and renovation projects. So say, for example, Groton was building a new police station. They're building a new police station. The people that they hire to build that police station, they'll get paid about 50% more, roughly, than what they'll get paid to build that same project in the private sector. So what you're doing there is increasing the cost of that project, which is going to increase the cost of the taxpayers. Now, not all these projects that get done in the state you know, whether they're, you know, they're done on the state level or they're done on the town or city level, not all of them go to in-state firms. Some of them go to out-of-state firms. So we got to pay these increased costs on these projects only to see your local property tax dollars leave the state because they're going to someone else who doesn't even live in the state. Amen. Uh, Representative McCarsha. Well, I support a uh, prevailing wage for a few reasons. <clears throat> I think for the most part, um, those who, who uh, work on these projects are people that live in Connecticut. You know, they provide Connecticut jobs. Uh, I've also seen uh, in instances and in even municipal contracts where a low bid contract was accepted. Um, the work was done in a very shabby fashion. I mean, if we didn't have prevailing wage, uh, I think we would have uh, a, a number of jobs that have to be done over again. And, and I've seen it happen with low bid contracts. I think uh, at least that guarantees you a level. Uh, generally, you have skilled local workers that do the work and you can uh, be, have much more confidence that the work will be done uh, properly. You won't have to hire somebody to redo it. So I, I support it. Okay, uh, uh, the, uh, we've kind of come full circle and the, the question is going to go to Mr. Lavery. The next question, that the, uh, the, the comments about the Jackson Laboratory investment and the uh, 
the, I think it was $370 million that was going to be borrowed to help build that project. So you strike a chord. We got some questions about uh, the, the level of debt uh, that the state is incurring uh, on various bond issues, both trying to encourage private business uh, uh, and infrastructure. So if you could, you could comment about your, your position on the, uh, uh, the amount of debt that Canada is incurring and what might be your approach uh, in prioritizing borrowing if you were a state legislator. But when it comes to our debt, our debt is increasing every single year. Our debt payments increase every single year. This, this fiscal year, we're paying about $2.4 billion just in debt, when our state budget is about uh, $20.25 20, $20 billion for just the, just the one year. So when I, as a state legislator, what I want to see, instead of adding to that debt, I see some of it paid off. Like we can't pay it all, all off in two years. We can't pay it all off in by 10, 20 years. Well, let's start paying it off and you know, stop adding to it. When it comes to projects like the Jackson Laboratory, well, having Jackson Laboratory in the state is going to be a wonderful thing. It's going to create a lot of temporary construction jobs. It's going to create a lot of permanent jobs once the, the laboratory is completed. The state shouldn't have to fund anything for that. It's not the state's responsibility to fund businesses, to fund the construction of new businesses. I didn't go to the state and say, you know what, can you fund everything I need for my business so I can start it? No. I used my own money, and I did it myself. I built it. That's my stance. And Representative McCosh, if you could, you know, comment on the, you know, the growing amount of borrowing the state has faced, and you know, the idea of, uh, of borrowing to encourage private investment. Yes. Um, <clears throat> when we reviewed this uh, project in the finance committee, uh, the uh, director of OPM, Benjamin Barnes, was there to, you know, brief us on it and answer questions. And I asked him. I said, "Well, what will this do to our, you know, uh, debt picture?" Where will this put us? And he, he said that uh, there was a number of other uh, debts that we were paying off and that we we have a debt ceiling. I mean, there's a cap on what we can borrow. It's a statutory cap. And we would it'd still be well below that. Um, the other thing is that we, we invest a lot of money in businesses in ways that are not apparent. <clears throat> uh, the one thing I like about this project is there's a price. You can see what it's going to cost us. And this is over a long period of time. This is not uh, $800 million or whatever amount it is in one year. It's over, I think, a 20-year span or a 10-year span anyway. Um, but there, we have many other investments in businesses, uh, tax credits that we can't even quantify. We do have a tax expenditure report. And every year, it's uh, just for um, business tax breaks, not property tax. It's $3.5 billion. We, essentially spend that in not collecting taxes from businesses. Um, and, you know, I, I, I heard earlier that, you know, Pfizer would have stayed if we had continued their tax breaks. Uh, and I think that's somewhat at odds with, you know, the statement that was made that we should be, ex we should be uh, not supporting business. I mean, I don't believe that we should be uh, attracting business with tax breaks and exemptions and credits and things of that nature. Uh, I believe if we're going to invest, and be partners with a, with a, uh, an entity like Jackson Labs, we have a price tag, we know what it is. And the other thing is they are, they're going to be operating here not as any kind of subsidiary. This is their business. So they're putting their full faith and credit in as we are, and they're investing. <coughs> so I, I'm very confident it's, it's a good deal. Thank you. Um, and uh, next up is uh, uh, Mr. Watson, if you could address uh, how the state's priorities are for borrowing, what yours would be. Well, the, you began with Jackson Labs, and, and, and us uh, challengers are a little bit of a disadvantage because we weren't up in Hartford when, um, when this uh, passed. Um, I, I do know that um, 18 to 34-year-olds are leaving the state in record numbers, um, and that's not a good thing. Um, they're the ones that pay a lot of our taxes. I also have a feeling personally that um, Pfizer probably wouldn't be moving to Cambridge had not the Horse Barn Hill thing happened up in stores uh, quite a few years ago. Um, as far as borrowing money to attract business, uh, I, I, I agree with Councilor, um, Councilor, <laughs> that's a funny one. Uh, Representative McCausher, I, I think it's going to create a lot of jobs. It's going to be a lot of people working, construction, and in the long run, if it makes jobs in, 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 uh, in Connecticut, I think it's a good thing. Uh, I think we should be, as a state, investing in trying to bring more businesses here. Thank you. 
And uh, last shot at that question, Representative Ray. Um, according to the State Department of Economic and Community Development, um, the Jackson Labs project is expected to create over 660 positions at a Jackson Laboratory in Farmington, plus 4,600 bioscience jobs would be generated through spin-off companies and another 2,000 would be added to local service and area retail stores and the project would yield more than 840 construction jobs as well. So yes, I think it was a wise decision. Uh, it is a role of government to engage in strategic partnerships like this to, um, in, which in this case will create a, a center of excellence in bioscience um, here in Connecticut. And I think it's, it's a wise investment for the future. In terms of our bonded indebtedness in general, <coughs> current out, debt outstanding is about uh, $19 billion. Two-thirds of that indebtedness was incurred in education-related bond authorizations and allocations for school construction and higher ed. So if the state did not bond for school construction, those costs would uh, devolve to the local governments. Connecticut is one of the few states that does bond, uh, uh, invest heavily in bonding for school construction. In most states, um, those costs are born at the, at the, principally born at the municipal or county levels. So I think we have to keep that in mind when we're talking about the state's bonded indebtedness. I would also note that... Can make just the last point, please? Yes. The bond allocations for fiscal year 11 were reduced to roughly the same levels that they were at in 2004, according to a chart that was provided by the Office of Fiscal Analysis. So yes, we are trying to bring that down and get it under control. But as I said, uh, most of that, at least uh, about two-thirds of it, is education-related. Thank you. Uh, I received a, uh, a couple of, uh, actually more than a couple of questions on, on a couple of um, crime and punishment bills. Uh, they were somewhat controversial, and I'm, I'm, I know it's fair now, I'm going to lump them together to try to uh, <clears throat> get to more questions. Um, and the, this question will be from Mr. Watson, first up on it. And uh, in this past session, the legislature uh, repealed the death penalty. And uh, there's also legislation uh, to allow for early release of inmates um, if they exhibit uh, good behavior, uh, uh, make efforts uh, that they're, they're trying to prove themselves uh, and, and increase the chances that they won't uh, end up back in prison. So early release, repeal the death penalty. Uh, the questioners want to know uh, the, the positions of the, the candidates uh, on those issues, and we can start with Mr. Watson. Okay, well, the death penalty and early release, they're two different, they're two different things. Um, I, uh, well, they're, 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 they're uh, I, I did, no release. They're not related at all. Uh, they, they wouldn't get released from prison if they, never mind. Uh, <laughs> The death, the death penalty, uh, this is a debate that goes on in my house all the time. Um, I probably, I would not have voted to repeal the death penalty. I think that people that do really uh, heroic crimes in our society, I, I just, I would not do that. Um, I do, and, and as far as getting uh, time for, good time for good behavior in prison, I think the Republicans actually pressured the Democrats up in Hartford to, to, to lower the line a little bit where uh, um, everybody was going to be able to get, uh, get early release time uh, had they uh, shown good behavior over a period of time. Unfortunately, I think that that line wasn't lowered enough. 
I think that there's some people out there that are accused or in prison for sexual crimes and, and, and some things that I would not want to give them time off for to, to, to lessen their prison sentence. Um, I, I would not have done that. So I'll leave it at that. All right, and thank you for indulging me for lumping those together and <laughs> putting that okay. challenge to the candidates. Uh, Representative Wright, your, your response. Uh, thank you. I, I'm, of course, very, very sensitive um, to the victims of crimes, and, and I understand um, the importance of honesty and empathy um, with victims and their rights as enshrined in our state's constitution. I did vote to, abol to abolish the death penalty prospectively going forward. Um, I was persuaded by the research in many cases where it has been found that people on death row have been later proven to be innocent. Um, eyewitness testimony is fallible. DNA testing is not foolproof. And DNA evidence is not always available in capital crimes. Um, Many studies show that the death penalty does not have a deterrent effect, and it's expensive. Um, and uh, I mean, the the cost of appeals is very expensive, um, and th those resources could be dedicated to preventive law enforcement measures uh, to minimize the number of crimes to begin with. Um, at the end of the day, it's a decision that cannot be reversed. And it does not um, help to foster a culture that values life and philosoph philosophically, at least, is against my own conscience. Um, Briefly, you know, on the risk reduction, yeah, last year um, the legislature enacted a statute that gives the Department of Corrections Commissioner authority to grant inmates risk reduction earned credits worth up to five days off their sentence for each month they participate in um, a reentry program. And it's important to note that inmates convicted of the most extreme violent crimes, murder, felony murder, arson murder, first degree aggravated sexual assault, and home invasion are not even eligible to earn those credits. So this program is one aspect of a recidivism reduction program. There may be some aspects of the program that the Judiciary Committee and the legislature might want to review um, during the next regular session, which starts in January. The good news is that crime is down significantly. In 2011, the number of persons arrested by police dropped by 11.4% compared to the average of the previous three years. Uh, recidivism among offenders has also dropped by ten, more than 10% in the last five years. And with a dropping crime rate, fewer people are being sent to prison. Three prisons have closed in the last two years, and most projections call for a continuing drop in the prison population, and we expect to be able to close more prison facilities in the years to come. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Avery, on the, uh, the issues of the, the bills passed to repealing the death penalty and, uh, and an early release program. When it comes to the death penalty, I would not have voted to repeal the death penalty. I strongly believe that it, it has a place in our society. We don't use it very often, but when we do use it, when we have used it in the past, it's been warranted. So I strongly believe that we should have kept the death penalty in the state. <clears throat> when it comes to the early release program, especially these early release programs for these violent criminals, we should not do that at all, plain and simple. If someone commits a murder, they're sentenced to 20 years, maybe 30 years in prison, that's what they should do, because they took someone's life. If they kidnap a child, someone kidnaps a child and beats that child, and you know, you've seen on the news, ha keeping them captive for years and years and years, they should be put in prison for the rest of their life, not released early, and that's how I believe. And uh, Representative Makasha. Yeah, I, I, I did not vote to repeal the death penalty. One of the aspects of this bill <clears throat> uh, was that it was prospective, that uh, all those on death row right now uh, would still remain on death row and would be subject to execution. Um, I think the people that, you know, that the, the supporters of, of that bill knows that, that those provisions are a sham. The, uh, you cannot have a two-standard death penalty. and, and uh, I'm sure that the legal challenges will be successful.
the Cheshire murderers will not, you know, be executed. Um, if they were ever to come up to be executed, I'm quite sure that the supporters of the uh, repeal of the death penalty would see to it that they were not executed. Um, and my, you know, my, my basic feeling has been a tough question for a long time. It's come up three times. It came up with Michael Ross, and you know, I, every time we come up with this question, I start thinking about the victims and uh, how they seem to be forgotten. I mean, all of a sudden, the life of this, you know, all these people that uh, you know are in question. There's no doubt of their guilt. They commit horrific crimes, and we end up uh, suddenly their lives are precious. I, I just I I feel it's a um, it's wrongheaded. It's a slap in the face of the victims. Uh, we have a prolonged appeal period. There have been proposals to reduce that. The state's attorney has such a proposal. The advocates for repealing the death penalty won't allow. They, it's like you know, killing your parents and declaring you're an orphan. I mean, they won't allow the, the process to shorten. And then they claim that it's so long that it's unfair for the victims. Well, they created that situation. So um, I didn't vote to uh, repeal it. As far as um, the risk reduction program, we've had various forms of this over the years, good time credits and things like that. One thing that we, I don't think we should have been proud of or were not proud of, we, I believe we had the highest prison population per capita in the country. I mean, we, we had tremendous costs for imprisoning people um, for a while there. That was our only solution. I mean, there are a lot of people that have mental uh, problems that really need treatment that are in prisons. Um, so I, I think that I did support the risk reduction program. It is not for violent offenders. Um, if we, you know, we'll review it, I'm sure. It's, it's, it's something that I think is intended to reduce recidiv recidivism. There are programs to do that, so I did support it. All right. Um, I'm sorry to get to all your questions, but we do have the, uh, the Senate candidates in our next hour, so we're saving some of those for them. And uh, uh, so...